We are delighted to have with us today Akinoam Nini, known as Noah internationally. You have achieved an international reputation as a singer, songwriter, poet, composer, percussionist. You've released 15 albums so far. You have sung at many venues, including Carnegie Hall, the White House, the Vatican. You've mm -hmm. collaborated with many great artists, including Stevie Wonder, Andrea Bocelli, and Sting. You're an advocate for important causes, including advocating greater empathy and initiating dialogue between Jews and Arabs in Israel. Wow. <laughs> to start with, how did you get started in music? When did you realize that you had to be a musician? Oh, that's a good question. It's, it's two different things, actually. Um, I got started in music as a child. I was uh, very interested in writing poetry and, and uh, writing songs and putting them to music, mostly a cappella. Um, even though I did play piano, but I just had a lot of melodies in my head and I would put my songs to music. Um, and I sang in choir. Um, I don't know, whoever, whoever doesn't know, I was born in Israel, but grew up in the United States, um, in New York City. And I went to religious day school, yeshiva, um, a school called SAR, Salanta Kibur Verdell, in Riverdale, New York. And my wonderful music teacher, Avshalom Katz, <laughs> was also the head of the choir, and he, he was a great inspiration to me. I sang in the choir, and I was his faithful and loving and adoring student. <laughs> and he um, amazingly always had time to listen to the songs that I was writing, that I would present to him at the end of class, and gave me an incredible amount of encouragement. Um, and I, I would write songs for everything, every class event, for every school event, for every family event. I was constantly writing songs. And singing, but I was also I was a very good student in other fields as well. I was good at maths and sciences, history and English literature, and um, I was pretty sure that I would continue to an academic career, some in some kind of academic career, not in music. Um, but all of that changed actually after I came to Israel. I, I made Aliyah when I was um, sixteen years old, um, and I went to a boarding school in Jerusalem, and then went to the army. In the army, I went to the La uh, Katzveit, meaning the, uh, the uh, army um, entertainment unit. We all, I mean, whoever in, whoever's familiar with Israeli culture knows that there's a, a great importance to the, uh, to the army. There was in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but today as well, these army entertainment units. Um, and, uh, and it's a good start. And from there, I went to the Ramon School of Music. And, and in these two phases throughout the, the high school and then the mi and military, I was still sort of teetering. I, I had such a clear musical talent. Everyone around me, was, to them, it was obvious that I would be continuing into a musical career. But me, I was still interested in going, you know, I wanted to go to Harvard and study English literature. <laughs> that was my dream. Um, but, um, but yeah, by the end of the army, I said, okay, that's it. I, I, I guess maybe it would be, it would be um, accurate to say that I felt that music had chosen me. And I'd chosen music, but it had chosen, or she had chosen me more than, even than I had chosen it. Because every time I opened my mouth, something something wonderful would happen, and people were touched and, and moved, and um, it was inspiring to people, and hugely joyful and, and satisfying to me. And I became incredibly curious about music and how I could express myself um, through it and with it. And, um, and I started exploring it, and it really became totally the focal point of my life. By age 20, I was totally immersed in music. And, um, and then I went to the Ramon School, and I met Gil Dorr. And that was a huge change for me. Uh, Gil Dorr uh, was one of the founders of the Ramon School. He was the academic director at the time. He was also my teacher for most of the courses that I had enrolled uh, for and um, in and I was totally fascinated by him. And the school at the time, and today as well, um, encouraged collaborations between students and teachers. So to make a very long story short, I had the opportunity to do this little um, gig with Gil in a jazz festival, just he and I, which was a great honor for me. And it was such a huge success. We got this incredible review from one of the toughest um, journalist reviewers in Israel, and um, everyone was blown away. And I was very happy. I didn't. I couldn't imagine that it would it continue. But um, as it happened, Gil decided to 
um, recommend me to Pat Messini, who is this incredible, wonderful, of course, Grammy Award winning guitarist, American guitarist, that, that Gil was, was friendly with. And Pat had said to Gil when, when he was visiting Israel some years earlier that if he had ever, if he ever ran into some special, unique talent, let me know, because he was always searching for it. So Gil called Pat and said, I found your, your woman. And, and he gave, you know, this, was, this thing actually happened. I did meet Pat, Pat and play my songs. He became very excited. This was a totally Cinderella story. And being excited about me and Gil and the thing we were doing together as well. And decided to produce an album for us. So that's how we got going. I mean, we started in Israel just doing our thing in Israel and, you know, gaining popularity we started internationally with, I mean, under the good graces of Pat Metheny, who we really owe our international career to. By the way, the painting that I have behind me, I'm sitting in my studio here, is actually Pat Pat's painting. He painted it and threw it away. And I <laughs> and I said, Oh my God, are you crazy? I want I want that to be behind me all the time to remember. Pat really is our hero. He is such an extraordinary man. And yeah, that's how we got started. And I'm delighted to hear that you got your start singing in a choir, which means a lot to us. Of course, yeah. And, and your comment, by the way, about music choosing you rather than the other way around, the great composer Ernest Bloch had the same, uh, had the same yeah. statement, the same sentiment. I'm sure he's not the only one, and I'm definitely not the first one to have said something like that, because it's, it's probably a sentiment that many, many musicians sure. share. Yeah. I think that a life um, alongside music is fabulous. And also very, very challenging and can be miserable. <laughs> it's a via dolorosa, as we'd say. <laughs> you, you bear the torch of music your entire life. And then it's, it's sometimes, you know, you feel degraded or miserable or misunderstood or underappreciated. And then sometimes it's glorious and wonderful and then satisfying and just the best thing in the world. It's a real roller coaster ride. But when you do it from a place of, of dedication and, and humility, I always say that, you know, we pray in the temple of the God of music. And it's not the God of fame, fortune, or glory that interests us. We don't recognize those. We really are trying to glorify music and um, using, um, if never using music as a platform to glorify ourselves. I think that's what real musicians at least have in mind when they come, when they approach music. And that, yeah, that's a, that's quite a, challenging and treacherous journey. So so you really feel that you have been, someone has pointed at you and said, okay, this is what you were born to do. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, well, beautifully, beautifully put. And certainly it's difficult, especially for those who achieve a position of fame, to keep in mind that it's not all about, about themselves. Yeah. Uh, and as you point out, success uh, is a combination of your own innate talent and those other circumstances of fate. Uh, for which you were blessed in, in both ways. Yes. So our, our program, as I mentioned, is about the role of women in Jewish music. So I'm going to ask you a few questions specifically in that area. Have you ever experienced discrimination as a woman in your mm -hmm. career? Mm. Well, no. I, I don't feel that that has been of the many challenges that I've had to, uh, to face, maybe that's not one of them, except for maybe one thing that I can mention. And that is <laughs> that um, it has always been a point of great frustration to me that people automatically assume that I am not the composer of my songs. Um, it's a very chauvinistic attitude towards women in general, especially if the woman happens to look fairly good, you know, and has a beautiful voice. Because if she doesn't look good and can't sing very well, you assume she's writing the music. Otherwise, what is she doing? I mean, what, what's she doing on stage? She, oh, she must be the composer. But if she's sort of pretty and she has a lovely voice, then she's probably the instrument and there's some guy back there doing the work. And me having Gil as my partner for 30 years, you know, and him being really a fabulous uh, musician, it was always, it's, it's generally assumed that he is the one writing the music and I'm just the one performing it. Or at best, I write the lyrics, you know? People will not ever give me credit. For, no, nobody will, th will go around thinking, oh, boy, Kala, Noah wrote that. No, 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 she sings that, but somebody else must have written it or it's not her. But it is me. 
I also wrote There Must Be Another Way. I mean, yeah. I actually wrote the entire song. Huh. And then Gil and uh, Mira translated respectively. But out of love and respect for them, I decided to split the credit and the royalties three ways so that if it ever became successful, we would all enjoy it. But the truth is, it's entirely my composition. Mm. And that those kind of things are, are things that I, I you know, that I, I have a problem with, I admit. And it always frustrates me greatly, you know, um, because I'm thinking, what do I have to do? I have to have to compromise my my performance skills or my vocal skills in order to gain some kind of respect as a composer. Why is it so difficult for people to accept the fact that a woman can be, or a woman um, musician can be multifaceted? She can do all of those things and do them well. You know, so but, but that's something I've been, I've I've been I've always say and I always mention. And Gil is a man; she always mentions it as well. You know, he's always very careful to. to, to point that out in interviews or whenever he's asked. Um, but um, but I guess that's not a battle that I can win all by myself. Mentioning it now is a little way of maybe okay. <laughs> change people's attitudes. You know, I mean, music in many ways had been a, a good old boys network, making it yeah. difficult uh, for women. Although certainly in recent years, it's been better. Yeah. And what you mentioned makes me think of, of Carol King, uh, who wrote songs for many others before she started to make her own career. Yeah. Know her career as, as a performer as well. So, a related question: Do you feel that as a woman you have a unique voice? Do you feel that as a woman you have an approach that is different from that of your male colleagues? Well, I would prefer to first say that as a human being, I have a unique approach. You know, I would first say that you know that that I, I try to um, to approach everything with originality, with uh, with depth. Uh, with respect, as I think an artist, you know, should do. If they consider themselves an artist and not simply an entertainer or whatever. I try to be a leader and not a follower in everything that I do. And I'm not in it for, um, just for the love and appreciation, but really trying to you know, un unveil some secret code in, in, in the musical phenomenon. Um, and also use my music to um, break walls and bring people together. Is this a feminine thing? I don't know. I know, and I, I, um, I think that that um, that maybe as a, a mother of three children, I'm extremely concerned for their future and the future of every child born to every woman and man. Um, I think I'm a very. I have a huge sense of responsibility, which I definitely implant in my music and my musical activity. Um, is that the kind of responsibility that comes with motherhood and parenthood or that every woman carries on her back? I think probably you know, the to-do list and the multitasking and all the things that, that this general care and concern for the future of humanity. Is that special to women? Maybe in some ways, but I'd really like to see it more as they're people that are built that way. They're wired that way. Mm -hmm. They're wired in the sense that they, that they care, that they do have a strong sense of responsibility, that they do feel that they, that raising their voice you know, for the better good, for, for equal rights, human rights, for, for freedom and humanity is important and that they, and they sh we, we should use everything we have at our disposal in order to promote these beautiful ideas. There are people who think that way and people who don't, <laughs> not necessarily women or men. I happen to be a woman. Yes. We all have, of course, multiple identities and uh, what we express as artists, as musicians, as performers, as composers, is made up of all of those identities. And, and identities are changing. You know, we're <clears throat> not the same way today as we were yesterday as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. <laughs> all right, we're going to focus now on there must be another way. <clears throat> Enayich, I believe, is the Hebrew title. Mm -hmm. yeah. And on this program, we are featuring Zamir's performance of that piece, which you co wrote in a way, with Mira Awad and Gil Dor, uh, as you explained just a few minutes ago. It was Israel's entry into the 2009 Eurovision contest. It should have won, but it didn't. <laughs> we you. love this song. In Zamir, <laughs> we love this song. Our audiences love this song, both the music and the message. So mm -hmm. can you tell us something about what inspired you to write, to write this song? Well, I'll begin with the fact that it was a very unusual thing for me to accept uh, representing Israel at the Eurovision Song Contest to begin with. Um, it is not exactly my musical 
or artistic cup of tea, Eurovision. It's, you know, pop bonanza, and that's not my world. Um, but um, when I was approached at the time, I was selected. It wasn't a competition. They just approached me and said, we'd like you to go, because I was already very famous, well-known in Europe. And they felt that that would be a plus and that people would, would um, be very happy to see me on stage in that context. Um, I said, well, I agree to go. Originally, I said, no way. And then I, I thought again, and I said, well, this is an enormous media platform. I mean, every, every outlet in the world is going to be there. So this is an opportunity to um, convey something deep and important and beautiful, not only another flashy pop song. Mm-hmm. I don't even know how to do anyway. Um, and so I said, if I, I told them, if you agree that, first of all, I write the song, I decide what the message will be. And I... And I also wanted to invite Mira with me. If you agree to those things, then I will agree to go. And the, the Israeli committee did agree and actually gave their blessing to fact, the fact that Mira would be joining me. And she agreed, which is absolutely not trivial for her to agree to, 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 to join me on this, on this roller coaster ride. And um, it was very challenging. Yeah, the whole process was extremely challenging. But... Um, But then, you know, then I went about writing the song and it was very important for me to write a song that was about peace without saying peace. I didn't want to write a peace song or a kumbaya song as my my sound engineer calls it. Um, I wanted something actually that had some minor chords in it that was that had the pain of um, when I cry, I cry for both of us. That's the ultimate message of that song. The two key sentences. Uh, um, my pain has no name, meaning that I don't think, and this is an important message that I want to convey, I don't think that anyone has a monopoly on pain and sorrow, even though both nations seem to think they do, and have a total disregard for the pain or the tragedy, the narrative, the history of the other nation. Um, and, and the quicker we, we erase that, 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 um, that disregard, that disrespect towards each other, the better off we'll be. Um, and then the second message, there, there must be another way meaning I'm not going to come with a list of solutions, even though I have some pretty good ideas about what needs to be done. But that's not the point. The point is that the the road we're on now is not a good one. I mean, we cannot um, sentence ourselves or subject ourselves to eternal violence, war, suffering, heartbreak, burying our sons. That is not a way to live. That's not a future that that we want for our children. So there must be another way and we have to find it. It's our obligation to find the other way. And, um, and so those two sentences, with those two sentences, I went ahead and wrote the entire li- lyric and the music and everything. And then, as I said, um, uh, Gil and Mira translated it. And this was another thing. This is the first time in Eurovision history, first of all, that Arabic was sung mm-hmm. on stage in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Eurovision. Turkish was, because Turkey has been part of the Eurovision for years, but Turkish is not Arabic, as we know. It's a mm-hmm. different language. Um, So Arabic, this was the first time and definitely the first time that a song from Israel, that Israel was being represented with the Arab Arab language, which for us was a huge achievement. And uh, yeah, Mira and I, we made a lot of waves in Eurovision and we didn't win, but it didn't really matter because every, I mean, we made the New York Times, uh, BBC, BBC Iran did a big interview with us, as did Al Jazeera. Um, every Israeli outlet, of course, and, and millions of people viewed this and the message came across to them. They understood what we were trying to do. It came across and uh, we got an endless amount of letters from young people around the world, Arab youth, Jewish youth, um, Christian youth, um, who were encouraged and inspired by what we were doing. And I, I consider it a huge honor and, and joy uh, when when choirs and ensembles and schools to this day it's amazing that today i got um a video from a from um, um a teacher in the ort school system here in israel or it has a program for arab and jewish israeli students that work together in schools and they created a video with there must be another way where they're all holding up the signs with the lyrics and they're singing it that is just so wonderful i'm so yeah. honored by that <laughs> Did, did you come up with the lyrics first and then the music? Do they come together? How does that work? Usually they always come together. Mm-hmm. They come in chunks, <laughs> sort of fall on me. I actually wrote, I remember writing that song specifically in the kitchen while I was cooking, which is where I write a lot of songs. 
I have a, I'm, I'm very blessed to have a beautiful window in my kitchen overlooking um, a lemon tree, beautiful field and, and lemon trees. It's a gorgeous window I love. It's right above the sink. And I stand there and I cook, you know, I wash dishes or I make salad or whatever. And I have, it's an amazing creative time for me because I have, my mind works in a way that when my, or when I'm driving, it's, it's like singing in the shower. It's the same thing. Your body is doing something physical, motoric. Mm-hmm. It sort of frees your mind to glide on a different, you know, you don't really have to think. It's not a huge, you know, it's not diamond cutting, <laughs> making salad. While your body is doing something, your mind flows. And that, that has been a, a great place for me to write songs, making salad. I think they say that many of the great inventions, the great ideas have come when people are in what they call a theta state of, of their mind. When, when you're not trying to do something, yeah. sometimes, totally as you it. say, it chooses I, you rather than you're choosing yeah. it. No, if yeah. I ever sit down and try to write a song, it never works. It just doesn't happen for me. Um, I, my, I, I, I don't do it that way. I, I have thoughts or things that bother me and they sort of simmer inside of me. And then I just need time doing other things, walking by the beach, driving. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I just go on really long drives by myself just mm-hmm. to get my mind moving. And um, and while I'm busy doing other things, music graces me with her presence. <laughs> Happens all the time. So you wrote the song and then uh, Mira translated parts of it to Arabic. Um, what role did uh, Gildor have? Gil wrote the Hebrew lyrics. I wrote the English. All uh, the, I wrote the entire song in English from top to bottom. It has all, all the verses in, in, exist in English as well. Huh. And that's the way the song was born. I actually don't, I hardly write in Hebrew at all. I, I write in English. And um, I, do, I write music to Hebrew poetry, but I've only made one album in Hebrew where I wrote the lyrics as well. Gil, on the other hand, is a fabulous Hebrew lyricist. And his Hebrew is in a very, very high level. So he trans- he did the Hebrew version. And do you play guitar or keyboard to write the arrangement? No, the arrangement is Gil's. I did the composition, just the composition, and, and the melodic. Com- the way that Gil and I work is that I come up with the melodic composition and the lyrics. And I have a very strong sense of the harmony. But since he's a much better, I mean, you know, he's a much, well, he's a better versed musician and also a fabulous arranger, I have enough trust in him. At the beginning, I would come with the entire song with the chords and everything. I play piano and, and, and guitar. But then I said, why? Why should I do that? I mean, much better to work together. If we, we have, our taste is so similar. We really resonate deeply musically. And um, I love his, his, his contributions and and I also really know what I want. So he can give me a whole selection of things and I can say, aha, that, exactly that is the way. That's the way we work. So he did the entire arrangement. I wrote the lyrics and the uh, melody and Mira contributed the, the Arabic. So that's about the music. Getting to the lyrics, it has a powerful humanistic message. Uh, it mm-hmm. is political. What kind of reception has it gotten? I mean, you mentioned that you've gotten a lot of letters of appreciation and that other people have sung the song. Um, I know that you've gotten some resistance. Uh, I read well, not, a few years yeah. ago that some of your gigs were canceled because of your politics. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that has nothing to do with this song, right? This song was very, very well received by everybody. I didn't get a negative reaction to this song. Mm there were negative reactions to our presence in Eurovision to begin with. Um, uh, because at the time that we, I think that Israel was, was involved in one of the endless Gaza offensives or whatever, some kind of a, a, a violent uh, conflict was going on. So people felt this is not the time to sing. Of course, I think the opposite. It's always the best, most important time to sing. Um, and second, you know, it, it, I was being criticized for, for bringing the enemy along to represent Israel. And Mira was being criticized as a fig leaf for the catastrophe that Israel was inflicting on her people and all that. We got a lot of flack. But she, we, we, didn't, we didn't bend or cave in. We just said to people, look, what we're doing is we're not necessarily representing a situation that exists in Israel, even though... There, there are many, many instances of beautiful coexistence between Arabs and Jews in Israel and many organizations that work for it. 
in schools and other um, institutions that um, that nurture it successfully. But we have a long, long way to go. And we definitely haven't solved our problem with our Palestinian neighbors across the Green Line. So what we're coming to show is what can potentially happen if we do find another way and we live together. This is an example of the kind of collaboration, the kind of, of, of um, friendship and, and, and sharing, sharing the spotlight, sharing the music. These two voices of ours, our voices have an uncanny um, uh, a way of, of harmonizing each other. And, and they, they fuse, they even sound like one person sometimes. They're beautiful. And, um, and so we were pointing, I think that's what art can very often do. You can point in a direction and show you what your options are. Maybe you don't see them exactly, mm. but, 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 uh, but art can illuminate that. And another beautiful thing that, that, uh, that we were doing, in it, even in the way we look, you know, I look very distinctly Arabic. My family is Yemenite which is an Arab country. So in, in, a, in essence, I'm an Arab Jew. I, I am Arabic. But um, Mira, her father is Palestinian. Her mother's Bulgarian. She looks totally Jewish. And she has this green eye, greenish eyes, and she's fair-skinned. So it was a very funny situation because when we would sit, media would approach us from countries where I'm not very famous, where they didn't know, oh, no, no, no. Like, for example, Al Jazeera. They would immediately approach me in Arabic and approach in Mira in English thinking she was Israeli. So we managed to confuse pe people pretty well, which is good, which is good, because it's very important. You have to sort of throw people off balance yeah. so that you can tell them things are not what they seem. There are other options and we have to rethink our situation. Um, and, we have and, to and burst some bubbles. Burst of bubbles, the stigmas, the, um, the, uh, the uh, paranoia, the fear the uh, walls we build um, and the, uh, you know, all, all these isms that we, we, we tend to entrench ourselves in. How did you connect with Amira Awad? I connected with her by chance, actually. I was looking at the year 2000. I made an album um, called Now. It was the year that my, my son was born, my first child was born. And uh, I, I wanted to do... Um, I wanted to, to record a version of, of We Can Work It Out, the Beatles' We Can Work It Out, uh, with a little bit of Middle Eastern inflection, and I wanted to have an Arab artist um, as my uh, you know, collaborator to make a message, to have fun. <laughs> um, so I was looking for a singer, a songwriter, or someone to uh, collaborate with. And, um, and Gil actually saw Mira on TV. She was, at the time, playing My Fair Lady in the Habima Theater which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, and uh, he was very impressed with her when he heard her being interviewed. Actually, she was being interviewed by Yair Lapid, who before becoming a politician was a TV host, yeah. a talk show host. Yair Lapid is one of the more, you know, more well-known politicians in Israel today. He runs a huge political party, but at the time he was doing interviews. Anyway, so Gil told me, listen, I've heard this girl, she's so impressive. She's so in super intelligent. And, uh, and I told him, well, did you hear her sing? He goes, no, but I'm sure she's great. <laughs> so, you know, well, she, she had a lead role in a musical. We assumed that she could sing. And, uh, yeah, so we met with her. It was love at first sight. And then we flew her over to Holland to record the song with us. So we were making an, an album in Amsterdam at the time. This album called Now on Universal, Universally. It was a wonderful experience, and that's how we got started. And then we started doing concerts together, more and more songs. It was nine. The, the Eurovision was only nine years later. We did an, uh, we, we 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 did recordings together. We went on tour, and we developed quite a friendship. And then in two thousand nine, we went to Eurovision, and then and we've been really close friends ever since. Uh -huh. And are you still gigging together? Yeah, we we're not exactly. We, we occasionally gig together. We do things. You know, we're going to do something for. Um, New Israel Fund of Australia in a few days, <laughs> a concert online. Um, but uh, but yeah, but we do a lot of stuff together. I, I recently released, um, I think, a very very beautiful song that um, um, on November twenty fourth, which is the day, um, the International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women. Um, that's what it's called formally by the United Nations. So it's, it's more awareness of, of the huge problem we have of violence against women. It's a very haunting song that, that, that uh, Gil and I wrote and 
recorded and Mira actually created the video. She's such a talented person. She does so many things. And lately she's been doing a lot of video um, of scripting and, and directing and editing. She's good at all of that. She's a huge multi-talent. So, she, so now we have this new collaboration as, as doing, doing videos. And, and so, yeah, I love her. She's my soul sister. Is that something we can see now? Is it up on YouTube yes, yes, it's or something? Online. Yeah, it's called Good Night My uh, Good Night My Child, Laila Tov Yele Chili. Uh you can find it on YouTube. You can find it on my website, noazmusic.com. You're welcome to check it out. It's beautiful. We'll look for it. Thank you. Well, this has been delightful. Anything else that you'd like to say to our audience? Um, well, first of all, um, thank you for listening, of course. And uh and I'm very, very proud that you're singing There Must Be Another Way. And uh, so that's something I'm going to leave you with <laughs> before I go and, and say to the And um, also invite one last thing, invite you all to join um, the live broadcasts that Gil and I do. Gil and I do a, a, um, have been doing a series of live broadcasts from home, actually from this studio where I'm sitting, um, which have been really, really successful and beautiful. Um, and um, you can find all the information on my website always, noahsmusic.com. For whoever is interested, there's a virtual concert, a concert a little thing that comes up right when you hit the website. And I would be very, very happy to see you guys online if I can't see you in person. <laughs> delightful, delightful. Thank you so much, Noah. Be well. <laughs> Survive this difficult time we're going through. And thank you for making the world a better place in so many ways. My pleasure and honor. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. All right. Thank you. you.